Welcome to episode 48 of the Cashflow Connections podcast. Our topic for today is how to get investors' attention, keep it, and pitch anything with Oren Claff. Today, we're going to talk about effectively communicating with investors, but before we can get into the details of one particular investment and all the details of that investment, we have to ensure that we have attention long enough to have that conversation and really talk about what we're trying to talk about. The reality is, especially when you have that initial conversation, there are a lot of things that can happen so that the investor will check out within first five minutes and you don't really get the opportunity to effectively communicate. In fact, there are things that you can do in the first 30 seconds that can really significantly reduce the likelihood that the investor is going to take you seriously, that you're going to appear credible. And these are all things that you can really simply avoid, but you have to actually know what to look out for. This is something that's not really talked about a lot. But luckily today, we have someone as a guest who has literally written the book on getting and keeping a potential investor's attention. So today, we're going to discuss what the crocodile brain is, how it operates, and what you need to do to get past it to actually talk to the part of the brain that understands concepts like IRR, return on investment, or even risk and reward. And we're going to talk about something which is an interesting concept which is almost never talked about in other sales books or presentations or webinars, which is creating a certain amount of tension in the presentation, which actually interests people. Now, you may hear that and think, oh, we're going to talk about some strategies I don't feel comfortable with. This is all done in a relatively playful manner. And the overall big picture conversation is that we all know what's going on, right? If you're trying to pitch someone, if you're trying to raise money for a potential investment, they know that the reason you're there is to talk about that. And that's totally okay. The key is In order to get someone's attention, sometimes you have to use certain strategies which will elicit certain responses which will put you in a good position. And I think you'll you'll hear from the conversations, it's all done in a very playful manner, but it can be very, very effective as well. There are so many little golden nuggets of overall conversations and selling in this conversation that I think you should really take a listen to this implement a lot of this right now. And as you start to develop, you know, implementing these different strategies, you can feel much more comfortable with it. I think your business is going to grow significantly. Also, don't forget, I'm going to be speaking at the Paris Hotel in Las Vegas on July 11th through the 14th for Freedom Fest. As I mentioned before, there is going to be some absolute all-stars at this conference. Robert Kiyosaki is going to be there, Steve Forbes, Ben Swan, a lot of these people that are in these types of circles, pretty much anyone in the freedom-minded investment space is going to be there. So it's just awesome. So if you're interested in attending, make sure to go to freedomfest.com slash register, and you can use the discount code CFC Freedom Fest for a $100 discount. And I really hope you enjoy this extra special episode. How's it going, everyone? Our guest for today is Oren Claff, who is the director of capital markets at the investment bank Intersection Capital, where he manages its capital raising platform. Since 2005, Oren has since grown the firm to approximately $2 billion in aggregate trade volume across a diverse portfolio of companies and transactions. He got his foothold by pitching million-dollar deals in commercial real estate in Los Angeles, and he is also the book of Pitch Anything, which we're going to discuss in great detail today. It's one of my favorite books on this topic, an incredibly entertaining book with a lot of really great content. So again, Oren, thanks again for coming on. Oh, well, I appreciate being invited here. I mean, there I was having a normal business day and now I'm spending half of it on your podcast. So here we go. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I really appreciate it. Like, like I said, you know, it's interesting. I really looking forward to this conversation because this is a book, you know, sales in general is something that's been covered over and over again, but it's clear from the onset that you have a very unique perspective on this and that it doesn't take the route that a lot of people take. And, and so, you know, I guess my first question is what were you seeing out there? What motivated you to write this? Was it that you were in the space seeing success in a way that other people weren't seeing success? Or were you reading sales books saying these guys are got it wrong? What was really the motivating factor? Yeah. So uh, I go to that list that you just gave me and none of those things were motivating me. I think in many of the cases with people have a breakthrough book or a breakthrough method or, you know, some kind of rise out of the ashes, the motivation was need, desperation, money, confusion, scorn of others. And so in my case, my, I had a very interesting but difficult partner. And what he would do is he would lock up a piece of real estate with a million dollars of our money. 
right? Then he would get a debt commitment. Say the debt commitment would be $15 million. We put in a million dollars of our own money for a $20 million deal. That left $5 million of equity to go find. And he would leave me 35 days from a dead stop to go find $5 million of equity. That's a really hard thing to do because the kind of assets we have, I mean, we didn't have downtown uh, two cap mid Manhattan multifamily, right? We had tertiary market retail or a kind of asset that required some explaining, required some effort to get in the market. So how did I raise $5 million in 35 days from a dead stop? And that created the birth of Pitch Anything. Interesting. So basically you were jumping into hot water, trying to figure out a way out, like what, what tools can I acquire? What strategy can I use to actually raise this money as quickly as possible? That's exactly right. Everything that worked in sales, anything that's any sales book, anything that was in the manuals, anything that the old timers said to do, anything that anybody else was doing was taking three to five months for that kind of situation. I had 30 days. So I had to ask myself, what is going to work three, four, five times better than the other sales methods and the other presentation methods and the other outreach methods? And so out of that question, was born the answer that was pitch anything. How do you do three, four, five times better than the competition, the old timer, the other guys, and the things that people are telling you to do? You sort of outgrow the internet's ability to coach you on how to do this stuff. You just have to find out for yourself with trial and error. Yeah, certainly. That makes a lot of sense. And and we are going to get into some of those strategies today because when you say three or four times, it, it really is no joke. There's a couple strategies that I know we're going to talk about that people that are listening to this, if you start implementing it, you know, day one, you're going to instantly see that your meeting is going to go a lot more smoothly. So I'm definitely interested in talking about that. But before we kind of get into those details, I really want to talk about, you know, the neuroscience that's in the book, which is probably surprising to a lot of people that weren't expecting that. Why did you take that stance? And why was neuroscience such an important part in terms of like the basis, forming the basis of a lot of these strategies, uh, the way that you outline them? So, so here's the thing. I mean, uh, this is something I didn't discover by myself. Somebody had to show me, but all the sales books, all the videos, everybody, everybody says, you know, the mind of the buyer, how do you get this information into the mind of the buyer? How do you get the buyer to decide? How do you influence the psychology of the buyer? And when I talked to a cognitive psychologist about how to get information into the mind, of uh, you know, buyer, the cognitive psychologist said, there is no mind. Like if you dissect somebody, there's no mind, right? There's no soul. There's no conscience. There's nothing you can physically touch. You're just a brain and the brain processes information. And you don't understand, Oren, how information gets into the brain, what it does in there and how it moves into us. That information becomes a influence that causes someone to decide to work with you. There is no mind, there is no soul, there is no consciousness. There is only the physical properties of the brain. And so I said, what are, what are those physical properties? Right? And that led me to understand how information physically gets into the human mind, how it's chopped up, how it's processed, how it gets up into the neocortex, and how it creates physically wanting in someone to buy from you, work with you, and a joint venture with you, be part of your deal. So that was a big thing. There isn't a mind, but there is a brain. You have to understand how the brain physically processes information. What were some of the, the key takeaways when it comes to that interest in neuroscience that you were surprised to find out when it came to sales? So, so we all have this model, and I did as well, of the brain as like email or a fax machine, right? So you function, your sense of awareness, of consciousness, of being, of problem solving, of language, of math, of doing things is your neocortex. We all have heard of the neocortex, right? So it feels like if I want to explain something to you, I process those ideas or I come up with those ideas, ROI, uh, investment, IRR, geography, type of asset, how it's managed, track record, all those kinds of things exist in the neocortex. And I form all of those into a story or a set of ideas. And then I process those ideas through my neocortex and I communicate to them to you in language and the sense is that that lands into your neocortex, like a fax machine, like an email, so, like some other form of communication. 
And the sense is that it then goes into your neocortex and you process. And we have two neocortexes talking to each other, trying to figure out how to do a deal together. But that's not the case at all. Information goes from my neocortex, again, the IRR, ROI, investment, debt, MES, senior, equity, uh, track record, reporting, geography, local market dynamics, competition. All of that comes out of my neocortex and goes to a very different part of your brain initially that doesn't understand any of those things. It doesn't even understand language very well. So once I understood that my ideas go to a part of the brain that doesn't care about ROI, IRR, or me, or anything much at all, then I started to understand how to package information uh, to move through the brain of another person so they could understand it and want it. And so, you know, I know what your next question is. So where does it go? So if you think about it, the human mind formed into three basic components over millions of years. First part of the brain to form is right behind your neck. It's in the brain stem and that we call the crocodile brain. And that un- only understands things like survival, right? It, it hears you, IRR, local geography, reporting, track record, uh, return on investment, make money, uh, double your money, whole period five years. And the only thing the crocodile brain is thinking is, huh, this is interesting. I see something moving. I hear something talking. Should I eat it? Should I mate with it? Or should I kill it? And you know, you felt that as well inside yourself. You see somebody talking or you just, you can't understand it. You're like, what is this? So the crocodile brain just tries to understand what is the survival value of these things that I'm hearing, right? Then, so, so it doesn't care about all the dynamics that you're talking about. And so it, it just really cares about, is there something in here for me? And it processes information very fast, very visual in a narrative format. It's trying to understand what is going on and is there any value? And then once you get through that part of the brain, Right, where the croc brain doesn't run away or say, I got to kill this thing. Then it gets up into another part of the brain called the midbrain. Right? So again, the part of the brain that processes the information next is the midbrain. And the midbrain doesn't care about ROI, IRR, local geography, reporting, any of that stuff. It just cares about what is the social status of you, the person presenting that information. Are you somebody of high value or low value in society? And it will only pay attention to you, that part of the brain, get your information, it will only go and access the neocortex. If in fact, it senses that you're a high value person in society and you're worth paying attention to. Then after all that struggle and fight and moving around through the brain, if the information feels like it's not scary and it doesn't scare off the crocodile brain and you feel like a high value person uh, in the dominant hierarchy, in the social structure, then the information gets up into the neocortex. So there's a huge amount of work to get information into the part of the brain where somebody will actually be willing to decide yes, no on your project. So once I figured out how to package information to move all the way up through the crocodile brain, then into the midbrain, and then finally into the neocortex, then deals started closing. Yeah, I think that's that's brilliant. And I think that a lot of people... They want to be armed with facts. They want to be armed with numbers. They want to be armed with financials. And sometimes they'll just dump that on you and or jump that onto a potential buyer. And the buyer has checked out 30 minutes ago. They have no interest in hearing the rest of the story because people can, you can lose a potential prospect very, very quickly if you do not set up the conversation in the correct way. Um, And so I appreciate kind of going through that there. In the book, uh, you have a mnemonic device that is STRONG. Let's talk about what STRONG stands for and, and how it helps you process your work. Yeah, sure. I mean, this is hours of conversation, right? Because it's really how to take a deal from having your deal, knowing somebody, and then in 20 minutes later, having to go, yes, I want to move forward. So STRONG is set the frame, tell the story, reveal intrigue, offer the prize, nail the hook point, and get the deal, right? So again, set the frame tell the story, reveal the intrigue, offer the prize, nail the hook point, and get the deal. But you almost don't need an explanation of each component if you just think about that acronym, right? Set the frame. Let people know who is the valuable person in the relationship, right? I have the deal. I control it, right? Yes, we're looking for investors and we're looking for people to go in, but I know the most about this market. I know the most about getting this kind of return. I know most about this asset. And good assets are hard to find. So setting the frame is I'm the most important person in this transaction because I have it and you don't, right? I have a good property and you don't. All you have is money. Money is a commodity. I don't need your money. I can get it anywhere, right? So I have the deal and good deals are hard to find. Money flows to deals. 
deals don't flow to money. Right. And, and I, I find that actually is really important and, and also very challenging for people that are just getting started. You know, if you're, you're trying to raise your first million dollars, let's say, and you're chasing around capital, they feel that you're chasing them. And kind of going back to the crock brain, the crock brain feels like something is chasing it. That means neediness, which is just, you know, probably the, the worst deal killer that there is. Um, but, but more importantly, if you can position yourself kind of what Oren is, is outlining there, which is the truth, which is that if you have access to quality deals, that is the rarity. That is the diamond. That is what every bit of capital that's out there, the trillions of dollars that are out there, they're trying to find those good deals. I mean, why do you think bonds are one of the most highly purchased financial assets? Because it's hard to allocate capital. So you can remember that in your mind and, and, and set up the frame appropriately with that in mind, you're going to have much more success. Well, let me jump in there. Not just bonds. How about German negative interest bonds, right? There you go. Exactly. So I can't find a good deal. So I'm just going to get a bond where I lose a little bit of money until I find a good deal. If you have a deal and you're a good person and you're credible and you know more about this market and this asset class and this deal and the competition and why it's going to work and the story about it and you're deep in it, you're the most valuable person that an investor can talk to today. And understanding that is one thing and communicating it is a second. And that's called setting the frame, making sure that we're not supplicating, we're not begging, we're not asking, we're not chasing, but we're communicating clearly. I have it and you don't. In order to get it, you got to ask me if you can get in my deal and you got to give me money. If you indicate that you're going to be difficult to work with, if you indicate that you're going to be a difficult investor or after you invest, we have to do a ton of extra reporting we're not used to doing. If in any way you want to lower our margin you want to slow down our process or be difficult, I'm out because I have a good deal and I don't need someone like you. I need a good investor, easy to work with, fun to be around, uh, does, di does a diligence on a speedy basis and gives me a yes or no. That's who I'm willing to work with, right? That's setting the frame. After you establish that you have the deal, you're the expert and you're interviewing the buyers, the investors, then you can move on to telling the story, right? And just the T and strong and just you know, we don't have the time here to get into it fully but yeah we won't we won't go through all of those because yeah. I, I think that you know before we even go from on to telling the story i definitely want to talk about frame control more because that's really the the most intriguing por portion of the whole book so before we even move into telling the story you know what are some of the main frames that people can get trapped into uh w without realizing it what are some of the the either when you walk into a meeting, you're, you're automatically in someone else's frame. How can you potentially identify that frame? And then what are some of the most popular ones people need to watch out for? So I think the big one that I address in Pitch Anything is the power frame. We've all experienced that. We walk into a room, we walk into a conference room or we get on a call and Mr. Big Shot is on the phone. So what do you boys have for me here today? Hey, I have a few minutes. Tell me why I should care about this. Oh, I've done a hundred deals in the last 12 months. This is just another one. Tell me what's good about this. Oh, I didn't look at your documents that you sent over. Why don't you start at the beginning, right? <laughs> right. This sense of I'm all powerful. Why don't you perform for me, dance in front of me, juggle in front of me, ride around on a little unicycle with suspenders, show me what you have. And then I'll judge what uh, I'll be the power player here. And I'll be a judge of what you have. And I'll let you know what I think, right? So that's the power frame. We've all run into that. And when we see it, we have to come up and we have to break that frame or we'll be dealing with it through the entire meeting, through all subsequent meetings, through the entire transaction. Have to shut down or break the power frame when it comes up. And, and, and so one thing is, it's not in the book uh, that I've learned subsequently, is when somebody feels powerful around you, three things happen physically. One is their focus and their vision narrows to a very, very small amount of information. So their vision narrows. Number two, they only see you at a very surface level. Okay. And then the next thing is they take unnecessary or extraordinary or unexpected risks around you. So they might check their phone, might take a phone call, might search eBay for Jeeps while they're listening to you. Right. Uh, and, and so that's what happens when you allow the power frame to persist. People have a very narrow line of vision. They only see you on a cursory basis and they take risks around you they otherwise wouldn't take 
if they saw you as more powerful. That's why you have to break the power frame. Yeah, definitely. And I think that, you know, one of the, the key things that you mentioned in the book is really starting this whole conversation off on the right foot with a time frame. Let's talk about a time frame briefly and, and how you set that frame and how beneficial it can be. Yeah, sure. I mean, a blind man in the dark, you know, a nine-year-old from Ukraine, uh, somebody who just swam up from the lost city of Atlantis can understand this, right? So time frames, we're all familiar. Hey, uh, what's the time frame? We might say that every single day, right? How much time do we have for this meeting? But when it comes to working with a buyer or an investor, we feel more hesitant about setting a time frame, right? There needs to be a time constraint on there needs to be a time constraint on the overall making the investment, right? So if you're a startup, right, a tech startup, and you're doing an app, a dating app for grandmothers, right? And you're going to meet with an investor. Well, what, you're not going to work with an investor on a $200,000 investment for a dating app for grandmas for a year, right? Somebody else will come out with it. So the, now you have some sense of timing. Well, probably for an early stage company, 30 days is the right time constraint to be willing to work with an investor. If they can't make up their mind in that amount of time, you're an early stage company, moving fast, lots of competition, need to develop it, you're out. So now we apply this same principle to real estate. What's a reasonable amount of time to work with somebody on closing a deal? I don't know, 30 days, 45 days, depends on the size of the deal, right? If it's an $8 million asset and a tertiary market in which there's 8% current pay, uh, 8% in ups after a four-year hold, What's the right amount of time to work with a potential investor on getting started on that? Probably two weeks. We just bring all that back to the meeting, right? So first meetings, first calls are probably 10 minutes is the time constraint. Hey, look, I've got about 10 minutes here today to introduce you to our asset. I know the desire is to talk for 60 minutes or 90 minutes if the buyer will let you. And for some reason, buyers let you talk for these long extended periods of time. But that's not the time constraint that's right for a first phone call. It's probably 10 minutes. For a second phone call, you can pitch the entire deal. You can't give me an asset. I don't care if it's a $5 billion building in downtown Singapore, uh, if it's the, you know, an island off the coast of, there's, of Hawaii. There's nothing that I can't pitch in 20 minutes flat. The big idea, how the world is changing, what problem this solves, what the solution is, how we do it, what the ROI is, what the IRR is, uh, what the key assumption is, what the pro forma is what the whole period, who's managing it and what our track record is. All of that can be pitched in 20 minutes flat. There's no need to pitch, go through a deal for an hour or 90 minutes. Sure, meetings can last for 90 minutes, but there's no need to pitch the details of a deal, an asset, an idea, a project for more than 20 minutes. So now you get to understand time frames, right? By controlling time, you also control the flow of information and you don't surpass people's ability just to pay attention to you. So a time constraint and a time frame is probably the most important skill that you need to get uh, in, in any business deal, especially if it's in real estate. Certainly. And that's part of, you know, the big picture stuff as well, you know, saying we only have 30 days to get this closed, but also just establishing it, particularly in that first meeting saying, look, I only have 20 minutes and then my next call starts. So let's go ahead and jump into it. That right there, if you are just starting out and if you start implementing that, regardless of if you have a call or not, you will see that the conversation goes much more smoothly. Most importantly, the potential buyer, potential investor doesn't feel like they're locked into some endless pitch. And that's really the most important thing. They know that you have more investors that are available, which is great for you and your credibility, but also they don't think that they're locked into some, some endless nightmare. Um, now what, one of the things that you may hear when you're starting this thing, okay, okay, I've got a 20 minutes, we can go ahead and start. And they may say, okay, well, I only have eight minutes. What are you selling? Or, and what, what do you say to that when someone says that? Yeah. So this is frame control, right? Because if you think about it, whenever you're in the moral right, or you're acting professional and somebody put some strain or stress on you, right? You can always frame their behavior or call out their behavior as weird, unusual, and you're not sure what's going on, right? So for example, if I go, hey, listen, we've got a multifamily asset in a tertiary market in Hawaii. It's on Maui, but not on the North Shore. And it's pretty interesting. I can run it through the big idea, how we got it, how we underwrote it, what the assumptions are, what the pro forma looks like. I can run you through the whole thing in about 20 minutes or less. And somebody goes, I've only got 
nine minutes, right? Well, in reality, to fully understand a real estate asset, 20 minutes is moving pretty fast. So I would say, oh, that's interesting, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Everybody else in the world, it takes 20 minutes to 60 minutes to underwrite in their mind, understand an asset. Are you an expert in this part of Hawaii? What's, do you underwrite in nine minutes? Are you a mathematical genius? What's going on with you that the whole world takes 20 minutes to understand a deal, but you can do it in nine minutes? Tell me a little bit about yourself. I'm interested to hear what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you will hear quickly that they are caught off by this because if, you're, if they're doing this kind of stuff, they're totally expecting you to just start and just to speak at 1.8x speed, which is a, a terrible idea to rush through your presentation. So that awkwardness will make them rethink that and it'll probably make you res them respect you a bit for, for knowing that that's odd. And they usually accept your frame, which is the 20-minute call. Isn't that correct? Absolutely. They'll walk back that position. The reason they're saying that is I'm not used to being in possession or being in front of or having professionals communicate to me. Boom. So what they're saying is I don't have all day, right? Just run it by me in nine minutes. I understand this stuff basically. If I'm interested, I'll let you know, right? And so once they have a sense that you're a professional, you know how to manage time, you know how to describe a real estate asset fully and that you can communicate the upside, the downside protection, the local market, the key assumptions and the pro forma in the right order, then they'll say, yeah, I'm very interested in it. They're not saying I only have nine minutes. They're saying, I want to be, uh, I don't want to spend my time the next hour hearing all kinds of randomly assorted details about some piece of real estate. And so they'll walk back and they go, oh, you're a professional. I certainly have 20 minutes for that. <laughs> right. Now, we've kind of touched on this briefly. It's, it's really an underlying theme of the whole book and a lot of this, this, these strategies, but pricing is something that you talk about. Briefly describe what that is and, and some examples of how you may do this during your pitch. Yeah. Well, uh, well why don't you briefly describe pricing? <laughs> Let's hear your version of it. Hey, if it's okay, we're at the 30-minute mark. I'm going to take over this interview. So uh, <laughs> I've heard you talk quite a lot about pricing, and I'm very interested to hear the thoughts that you've developed on it because it's obviously something you're using effectively in your day-to-day -day selling and business. I, I like that frame control. And I, I so, you know, generally speaking, pr pricing is really understanding, number one, why the conversation is taking place. People do not take calls because they're just interested in talking to random strangers. So in the event that I'm on a call with someone, it's because they have an interest in investing somewhere outside of the stock market, and most notably in real estate. And so if you take a moment to realize that, they're not doing it for fun. They're not doing it because you're friends. They have an interest in some type of alternative investment in real estate. So particularly when I'm talking to people that are just getting started, it's important to notice that you have the prize. You are the prize. Like I said earlier, there's trillions of dollars out there. You have access to that, uh, these, these unique opportunities and making sure mentally that you're prepared for that is really going to set the entire conversation up. Um, that may not be the technical definition of it, but that's certainly how I think of prizing. Remember that you are the prize and, and never being needy in a business meeting. Well, I think that's right. Let me expand on that a little bit, but that's right down the center of the fairway. You get on the phone call with a potential investor or buyer. They're not paying you. You're investing your time into helping them out. You are the expert in this. As I said before, you know more about this. You know what's a good deal, what's a bad deal, how to invest for certain kinds of objectives, right? In some sense, you're a wealth manager, right? You're the expert and they don't know what to invest in. They don't have the expertise to analyze the kind of asset that you have and you're helping them out. And prizing is establishing yourself as the prize, not the buyer. We're not going to run around and fetch another rock and chase things around and uh, help this buyer out unless he recognizes we are the best in the world or one of the best at what we do. We're extremely helpful and we are um, somebody that, that the buyer should want to spend as much time with as possible to understand how to spend their money. So for example, uh, you know, just the most basic level price, instead of saying, thank you, Hunter, thank you, John, thank you, Tim, thank you, Susan, for taking this call. I'm really excited to tell you about the properties that we have on offer. Instead, you could just say, Hey, I'm glad our calendars finally matched up. We're super busy. This is our third asset in this uh, geography and in this category. 
and we're extremely busy filling the investor demand for it. I'm glad I could take some time out of my day, matches up with your calendar. We could talk a little bit about it. And then uh, I can tell you a little bit about, I can invest a little bit of my time telling you about the asset. I can give you a little bit of time to ask some questions. Uh, here shortly, you know, call in half an hour, we can figure out if there's enough overlap between what we're doing to try and move forward. That's how you prize, right? That says, I'm not chasing you. I don't need you. We syndicate or we sell out these assets uh, independent of your approval of us. I don't need your approval. Uh, I'm not, I don't need your validation to continue. I'm here professionally for a short amount of time to tell you what we're working on and at the same time, evaluate you and see if you'd be a good buyer or investor for our deal. That's pricing 101 straightforward. And to the degree you can open, and you don't have to say it mean like that. I know it may sound mean. (laughs) (laughs) You can say that in the nicest way possible. But clearly that the prize in this relationship is me, not the investor. There's a million investors out there. There's only, again, I can't say it enough times, only one of us who have this asset and this understanding about the deal. Yeah, I think it's a good, you mentioned the, uh, you know, the way in which you say these things, it's interesting. So each, you know, there are probably some people listening to this saying, whoa, this is, this is way too much. This is way too aggressive, or it's, it's not just in my personality. Well, you can use these strategies and make them work in your personality um, to the extent that one thing that's really important to remember is that we're taking the meeting. We want money. Right. If, if we're raising capital for a deal, we, it's clear that we actually want money. But you can kind of play with that dynamic, and it's such a breath of fresh air if someone is actually raising capital that doesn't act like they're they're just – that's all they want to do, that they just want every single investor. I mean the reality is when you start to see success in real estate in particular, you're looking at investments, long-term investments, illiquid investments. You're dealing with the investors for years to come. When you start to have success, you realize that you can actually be picky with your investors. So a lot of investors are, or a lot of syndicators are using these strategies naturally because it's just because they have experienced success and therefore they are not really uh, thinking of the capital as the prize anymore. Um, oh, something else I wanted to, yeah, go ahead. I just jump in. We're not suggesting here that you do anything that's a method, that's a technique, that's a negotiation tactic, that is a sales tactic. This is what you should be doing right? Is saying, hey, Hunter, I I know we're talking about the asset. You came through a great referral. I'm very interested in getting you into our deal. I think you'd love it. I don't know enough about you at this point that if you sign the subscription docs right now, I'd have to give them back to you. I need to take in an investor on our side is a entering a serious relationship. I sure would like to learn a little bit more about you before figuring out some way to go forward. That's what you should be saying because anybody right. had a difficult investor, a problematic investor, an investor uh, who is litigious knows that you want to do more diligence, not less on people coming in to your deal. So we're just formalizing that process. And, and professionals, will, again, will be glad to hear you say that. Oh, that's great. I'd love a deal where you know, we're coming in, uh, you're investigating me because I want to be in a high quality deal where everybody who's in the deal is vetted. Uh, And so the suggestion is just to, again, formalize, professionalize, and do it at the correct time. But these are all things, if you're in any kind of deal, you should be doing anyway. Yeah, I agree with that. And and something else I wanted to touch on is is that a lot of me listeners may be listening and saying, okay, this may work for typical mom and pop accredited investors, but this isn't going to work on Wall Street. This isn't going to work on Silicon Valley where people are super analytical. They want to see the numbers. I can tell you this. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. It's it's actually the opposite. It is people that are in Wall Street, people that are in Silicon Valley that are used to doing a lot of deals and used to being pitched frequently that are more difficult to get through that first part of the brain, the crock brain. So, and I, Warren, I know you've uh, done a, a lot of, of high quality deals, a lot of you know, multi-hundred million dollar deals, et cetera. Can you kind of speak to that as well? Yeah, so I, I think that's right. While this is, it's psychologically important for, you know, accredited investors or people putting in, you know, a quarter million dollars, but more so when you work with private equity, when you work with venture capital, when you work with institutions, this is more uh, the process that they expect. I get calls from Goldman Sachs, from JP Morgan, from Bank of America, emails every day. 
Hey, Orin, we love pitch anything. I'm just writing you to let you know you didn't invent this stuff. We do it every day. <laughs> so <laughs> right. I'm not claiming to have invented it. I'm claiming to have written it down. So th- this is not an invention. If you wonder what happens at Goldman Sachs when they're doing a $100 million deal, when they're doing a $1 billion fund, it is these things that I wrote about in Pitch Anything exactly. I'll tell you a little story. We were funding a company, $30 million, a, uh, a tech company out of Los Angeles. And we were in Boston with an investor and the, and the CEO had just pitched uh, the deal. And I felt like it was a little bit pitchy. It was a little bit needy. He went off the script that I gave him a little bit. And I jumped in and I said to the investor, uh, I think this is a good time for us to slow down a little bit. Obviously, you can see the quality of our deal. We're going to crush through $10 million of revenue this year. Our margins are at 30%. We've got $500 million in pipeline that we're working on. We know it's a great deal. Thank you for your compliment. At this time, we'd like to know a little bit more about you. How have you treated your other investments? How many investments have you made? How have those investments worked out other than we see in the portfolio? When something goes wrong in a company, do you just put the jack boot of the investor on their neck or do you jump in with another check and try and help out? How do you behave and who else says you're good guys? And if I ask your CEOs how you've treated them and how they like working with you, what will they say? And there was a long pause and my CEO was having an internal panic attack because he felt like I just blew up the entire deal by insulting this potential investor for $30 million. The investor cleared his papers out from in front of him, took a deep breath, sighed and said, thank God, I've been doing this for 15 years. Never have I had a company ask me those questions, but I've been waiting to be asked them. Uh, all they want is our money and they don't want to know anything about us. And then he went on to describe him. It was almost embarrassing. You know, an incredible track record of success and what their companies have done, both in the private and public markets and how many have been acquired and what they do when a company falters and how they come back in and wrote additional checks uh, and what it's like to work with them and who else they work with and the times they met with the president uh, and they're on the president's advisory committee on finance and economic council and how they work with Harvard University and Yale University and they've done a uh, uh, you know, 100 investments in which 90 have worked out. And so it was, it, it sort of backfired because they were so good, but they just wanted a chance to explain the quality of their firm and why they're good to work with. And they were deeply appreciative of those questions. And that's how it works with institutions. Now, yeah, that's actually a, a great segue because one of the things that you touched on, I think is really important. You're kind of doing this balancing act, which is the push pull of desire and tension. That's obviously a great way to build tension. Anything to do with a long pause and silence is a great way to build tension. But talk briefly about the, the push pull of desire and tension. Yeah. So this is really the challenge. I want your money. I want your investment. I'll work hard to get it. We need it to close the deal. I have to, in some ways, chase you or at least be proactive. On the other hand, I need to communicate, I don't need you, it's moving, the train is leaving the station without you, you're interesting, but you're not essential, and I need to learn a lot more about you before I'm willing to take your money or let you invest. And those are two sides of the pancake, no matter how thin it is, right? And so how do you manage and how do you communicate those twin dynamics? And so I've found over the years that you can almost communicate it with clarity. Say, listen, I'm really interested in this deal. I like you guys. You're straight down the middle for our deal. And I think if you were in, you would really enjoy working with us. And obviously the returns we have are a great fit for you. However, I also have some concerns and there's some things I need to get over and some things that I've noticed about you guys that I want to discuss openly. Right. And so without clearing those up, as much as I want to do this deal and I'm excited to do this deal. uh, And I think we work together without clearing those things up, I don't think we, w- we could be friends. We could, you know, because clearly there's a fit here. We could send each other Christmas cards. We could play football, Thanksgiving, whatever the case is, but we might not be right to work together. And so for me, the more sophisticated you are at the push-pull or letting people know that you want to do the deal, but you're not going to do the deal, you can start to use all kinds of language around that. Around that. So, so I might say, hey, listen, I'm not going to do this deal for you, right? I'll do it with you. I'll work as hard as you do, but not harder. You have to want it. You have to work hard and you have to appreciate the relationship. And on our side, we'll do everything we're supposed to do. And we won't stop when we're tired. We won't stop because it's Friday at five o'clock when there's something done. We'll stop when the job is done. 
But on your side, you also have to participate. And I need to learn. You know, we have all our collateral. We explained to you the deal we've done. Uh, we've got a track record. We've shown that I need to learn a little bit more about you in context of what we're doing so we can be peers and we can work together in this deal. So there's all kinds of language like that you can start to use to communicate. I want the deal, but you can't have it until we're further along together. And by the way, that further along can happen by the end of the meeting. But if you don't introduce that aspect, then somebody just feels that you're chasing them, that it's sticky, it's, it's sweet, uh, you're needy, and that, uh, that, that they want to go away and think about it. The reason people say, this is very interesting, I want to think about it, is your neediness is triggering that behavior. If you eradicate the neediness, they're much more likely to want to try and become your peer and do a deal with you. Makes sense. You mentioned the neediness. It's obviously the number one deal killer. What are some strategies people can use to completely drop this from their language, drop this from their conversations? Yeah. So I think first we have to understand what neediness does. So if you think back maybe 150,000 years ago uh, when commerce just started, or uh, you know, I think 200,000 years ago, 150,000 years ago, it was just the beginning of sort of transactional commerce. But basically, everything was scarce, right? If you had an axe, that was maybe like the one thing you got in your life. So you might have an axe, right? Or some kind of tool. You might have a little bit of fire and maybe you had a woman and a dog, but that's basically all you had. Everything was scarce. And if you're a woman, maybe you had a dog and a husband, <laughs> right? And some kind of uh, tool, but everything was scarce. If somebody came up to you and they wanted something from you, that incited panic inside of you because you didn't have anything, right? The four things that you had, uh, five things, you know, a place to sleep, a dog, a mate, some fire, and a little bit of food and an ax, six things. If anybody wanted something from you, then you would lose something incredibly important to your survival. And that's where neediness came to trigger fear, panic, and scarcity. So anytime you want something from somebody, it triggers those ancient emotions in them and makes them unconsciously, and they're unaware of where that emotion is coming from, but emotionally afraid of you and they want to go away. So the, whatever way you do it to eradicate neediness, it's got to be done because neediness creates fear, neediness kills deals, neediness scares people away. And so to your question, how do you eradicate neediness? I mean, there's a million ways to do it. We talked about some here is understanding I'm the best at this kind of deal. I'm, you know, I'm the best at Midwest self-storage in tertiary markets where there's an eight to 12% current pay yield. Nobody does that better than me. That's the first step to eradicating neediness is knowing that you're the best at what you do and the investor has the opportunity to spend time with you and that you can take that away if they don't behave well. I mean, I think I cover it in great deal in Pitch Anything. So if you want to learn more about neediness, that's probably the first stop. Yeah, definitely. And I'm a huge proponent of the book. Everyone that's listening, you should check it out. It's a, it's a complete 100% you should listen to the book. It's incredibly entertaining and very educational. So before we kind of we, we jump off, Warren, I'm definitely interested in, in kind of hearing where you're seeing a lot of the opportunities right now. I know that you're seeing deals on a regular basis. So is this something where you're thinking that, that real estate is, is still a really valid option? I'm not sure where the, where the market is or, or where your perspective of the market is. What are your thoughts on the deals that are coming across your desk on a regular basis? Yeah, so uh, I think, you know, I see the juiciest stuff. So it's hard for me to answer that. I mean, I have a great name. I've done a huge amount of deals. I have access to capital. We deploy capital ourselves and you know, I have a good team and I'm in California. So I might not be the greatest person to ask because, you know, I get led into sort of Bay Area multifamily deals, which you can't screw up. You know, Houston... Austin, Dallas, self-storage, in which there's a you know, continuing need for it. Yeah, I, I get into those things. And, and so my sense is that w where I see some opportunity that's not obvious is infill Bay Area office, right? So, so if you think about this trend of everybody just needs a little bit of office space, and that's what's made WeWork a huge deal. But you can, for my mind, and, and this is a trend I'm seeing, you can burn out the utility of a WeWork space and actually need a little bit of space on your own where you can bring a client and you're not bringing them into you know, a WeWork space with bean bags and cappuccinos and kids throwing paper airplanes and all that kind of stuff. So small space for uh, mainly remote come, but working 
uh, companies who can come in and meet clients somewhere decent in a space they call their own and not break the bank on that space, I think that's a good opportunity. Awesome. Well, I'm definitely interested in having you on more to talk about more specific real estate stuff. Other than that, do us a favor and let us know some of the ways that listeners can find more about your book, your firm, other things you offer. Yeah. So here's a problem is I set up our website maybe a couple years ago. And when you sign up at pitchanything.com, we give away a huge amount of stuff. Today, it's not because my name is so well known. We don't really need to give away that many pitch decks, that many scripts, that much material. Uh, and But we don't have the time or the staff to take it down. So for the moment, I would jump over to pitchanything.com. I would register and scrape all the information that we give away right now because really I shouldn't be giving that much stuff away. Pitchanything.com. Awesome. Well, Oren, thanks again, man. I really appreciate, really enjoyed the conversation. All right, Hunter, I appreciate it. And uh, as a wrap up, we have on cue a UPS truck pulling up and making a huge amount of noise. <laughs> awesome. Thanks again, man. Okay, terrific. All right, listeners, thanks for checking out the episode. As always, the contact information for our guest will be available in the show notes page, which is hosted on SoundCloud, iTunes, and Stitcher. Don't forget, if you want access to some of the free goodies that I'm talking about at the beginning of these episodes, like free eBooks, weekly investor emails, and articles about some of the most important investment-related topics, make sure that you have created an account with CFC because this stuff is automatically available. You can do this by going to cashflowconnections.com and signing up as an accredited investor. Of course, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hunterthompson at cashflowconnections.com. Thanks again.